Hey guys, this video today is going to be a continuation of my last video where I went over in detail the evil agenda that's being forced onto the world that we went over um, in this chart here. And today, uh, I, since last time I went over what the agenda is, today I'm going to get into how we can defeat the agenda. Now, if you haven't already watched the original video, I recommend that you go back and do that before you continue watching this video. I'll put a link for you in the description so you can watch that. That will give you a lot more context about what this agenda is that we are in the process of defeating. And we will win, by the way. Spoiler alert, good always wins over evil in the end. What our choices, what our actions determine is how long it's going to take, how much suffering or how little suffering is going to be involved. And then finally, we get to choose what is our unique role in defeating this evil agenda. And so speaking for myself, I want to be on the front lines. I want to be playing my part. I want to be doing some good for the world. So if you feel the same way, then you're going to love this video. Okay, now there are a lot of ways that we can defeat this agenda, and some are going to be more effective than others. And you can see, you can revel at my amazing paint skills here in, in creating this graphic for you. But uh, as I mentioned in the last video, there are uh, political agendas, there are economic agendas, and then there are social agendas. Now, in this graphic, I decided to split the social into two categories of cultural and spiritual. And I believe that everything that we see in the world works in this pyramid format where the political is the most obvious. That's what we see on top, but the political is just the result of everything underneath it. It's the, uh, the least important in the grand scheme of things, that everything starts with spiritual and then the culture builds on the spiritual, the economy builds on the cultural, and then the politics builds on the economic. And so just to give you a quick example of this, if you can convince people on the spiritual level that uh, God doesn't exist and there is no afterlife and that we're all just biological beings that are going to return to dust as soon as we die, um, well, then you can infuse the culture with this sense of hopelessness that there's nothing to live for, there's no purpose. So uh, what makes sense is either if, if we enjoy life to be hedonists and to chase pleasure or if our life is not so, so enjoyable, then just to kill ourselves and get it over with early. So that's the culture that, that derives from that spiritual mindset. And then if you have that kind of hedonistic culture, then the economy is going to be one where everybody is seeking pleasure. Everybody is spending their money on their own pleasure. So uh, the economy is going to be very good for the people that are selling alcohol and selling drugs and selling prostitutes and selling antidepressant pills, etc. And then you're also going to have a huge degree of economic inequality, right? Because uh, people are going to pull out all the stops to get as much for themselves as they can, and they're going to trample under anybody who's weaker than them. So you're going to have a few people that have a ton of money and a lot of people that don't have any money. And of course, there's not going to be any charity because why would you waste your pleasure on, on somebody else who you know doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things anyway? And so if you have that kind of economic system, clearly you're going to have a ton of hatred, a ton of resentment, a lot of, a lot of class warfare. And so you're going to have a political system that might be like communism. right? It's going to be really easy to, to uh, buy off the people and to manipulate the people by playing into their their class resentment and by uh, buying them off with bread and circuses by saying, hey, vote for me, support my campaign, and I'll give you X, Y, Z, right? You're gonna have a very corrupt economic system. So that's what I mean when I say that the, the spiritual is at the, re the root of all of this. And when we're talking about how to fight this agenda, when we're talking about how to change the world for the better, you can focus on any part of this pyramid, but the farther down you go in the pyramid, the more effective the strategies are going to be, right? You can fight at a political level. You can fight at an economic level. You can fight at a cultural level, and you can fight at a spiritual level. And there are valid ways to do that at every single level. Um, but the further you go down the pyramid, the more effective it's going to be. So in this video, I'm going to show you uh, how to fight this evil agenda on all four of these different levels. And I want to make it clear that, that I'm going to start with the, the higher levels, the least effective levels, 
and the further I go, uh, the more effective strategies I'm going to get to. So I wanna make it clear that you don't have to do all of these things. You only have so much time in a day uh, and you have to pick your battles to some extent. So I would recommend that you focus on the things that I'm gonna go over towards the end of the presentation rather than the ones that are at the top of the pyramid. But I wanna go over all of it so I give you a holistic view. And just because something is not the most effective doesn't mean it's worthless, right? Even something up here in the political on the top of the pyramid can still be effective, uh, just less so than all the other levels. So I'm gonna go over the less effective strategies, but I'm gonna go over those a little bit more quickly, and I'm gonna focus most of my attention here on the more effective strategies towards the bottom of the pyramid. Okay, so the solution to the control agenda is of course the freedom agenda. And so I'm gonna go over things that we can do on every level of the pyramid. So I'm gonna start with the political and end with the spiritual. So, um, I mean, the most obvious thing that we can do under political is, is just to vote. Right, and I'm not gonna try to tell you who to vote for. And actually, I kind of, I, I recommend shying away from that if, if possible, right? Try not to take sides between uh, this candidate and this candidate or this political party and that political party. The reason for that is because people get so uh, attached to their team, right? It's, it's, like, it's like a sports team almost. You know, you have the, the Eagles versus the Rams and, and the people that support the Eagles love the Eagles and the people that support the Rams love the Rams and they don't really have any reason for it. It's just that that's what they've affiliated themselves with. So the same thing happens with like Democrats and Republicans or with this candidate and that candidate. So um, I, I'm definitely not gonna tell you who to vote for, but uh, I do recommend that you vote. And of course, I'm gonna recommend that you vote for the people that are doing the things that are consistent with the freedom agenda in which are in opposition to the things that are consistent with the control agenda. And I think you can use your judgment to figure out which candidates are in line with which agendas. Now, uh, next thing you can do under political is donate, right? So you can donate to the same political campaign or the same party or whatever that the person you're voting for is. Although frankly, I think if you have that money lying around, there are probably better uses you could make of that money than donating it to politics. But it's always an option, so I figured I'd put it. The next thing you can do is refuse to comply. When uh, a government or a politician makes a law that is against the freedom agenda and is in concordance with the control agenda, that they are making a law for the sake of controlling you and not in your best interest or not in the best interest of society, you can refuse to comply with that law. Because governments really only have power with the consent of the governed, right? I mean, the politi politicians can put people in jail for disobeying the laws, but they can't put everybody in jail, right? So the more people that are, that are willing to refuse to comply with tyrannical laws, uh, the, the more the government is going to have to back off because they can't punish everybody. And there's a very interesting effect too that when one person stands up for something and other people see it, it, it lends courage to the other people that they can stand up to it as well, right? I, I really like the story of the emperor's new clothes, which if you don't know the story, I'll give you the really quick version, is that a couple of tricksters um, go to the emperor of a country and tell him that they can make him this amazing suit of clothes that only people who are smart and sophisticated can see and uh, everybody else can't see it. So they say it's a great idea because that way you can figure out um, who on your court is, is worth trusting, right? Who is smart and sophisticated and who's stupid and not worth trusting. And so uh, the, the king thinks, okay, or the emperor thinks that's a great idea. And so he's all about it and he contracts these guys to make him this suit of clothes. And so they make him the suit of clothes and it doesn't exist. They pretend to be putting clothes on him, but there are no clothes. And so the emperor himself is horrified by this and he thinks, oh no, I, I can't see the clothes. I must not be smart and sophisticated. And so he thinks, well, I can't let anybody know that I don't see the clothes. So he pretends that these are the most amazing clothes ever. And so he goes and parades naked in front of his court, 
telling his court, look at these amazing new clothes that these guys created for me that only people who are smart and sophisticated can see. And of course, nobody else in the court can see the clothes. So they said, they, they all applauded too. They said, wow, what an amazing suit of clothes. And so then the emperor goes out into the street and tells all the people, he says, look at these amazing clothes that only people who are smart and sophisticated can see. And so all the people say, wow, what an amazing suit of clothes. Because of course, they don't want to admit that they can't see the clothes. And then finally, at the end of the story, a little boy points to the emperor and says, why is the emperor naked? And then when that little boy said that, then everybody realized what happened. Everybody realized that they had been tricked, that they had been manipulated by their pride to pretend something was true that clearly was not. And I love this story because it's so true to the way that human nature works in, in various ways. One is that people can act really stupid uh, as a collective, as a crowd. Two is that pride makes us very easy to manipulate by people who know how to do it. And three, and the thing that I want to emphasize here, is that it only takes one person standing up and telling the truth to shatter the illusion for everybody else. So when I say that you should refuse to comply with the tyrannical law, you're being that little boy. You're being the, the first person to stand up and say, I'm not afraid of the consequences. I'm going to do what's right. And when one person does it, then other people are willing to do it. You know, there's a very interesting uh, psychology experiment, which I, I don't remember the exact details, but they get a bunch of people in a room where um, all of the people except one are actors. It's like, say, like six actors and one person that's a test subject that doesn't know what's going on. And then they ask them a question to which the answer is very obvious. Like they have uh, two lines on a paper, I think, and they ask if the lines are the same height. And it's very obvious that the lines are not the same height. But they ask all the, all the people, one by one, starting with the actors and then leaving the, exp the test subject for last. And they ask the, and then all the actors give what is obviously the wrong answer. They say, yes, the lines are the same height, even though they're clearly not. And so there's six people say, yes, 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 yes. And then the last person is freaking out because everybody else is saying yes, but he recognizes that the light lines are not the same height. And the vast majority of the cases, the experimental subject says, yes, the lines are the same height. The experimental subject decides to go along with what everybody else is saying instead of what he knows to be true. And so they did a modification of this experiment where it, it was the same experiment, except that instead of every actor saying yes, there was one actor who said no. And in that case, the test subject, in most cases, said no as well. That if there is one person who is willing to tell the truth, then that gave the test subject permission to also tell the truth. So when you stand up for the truth, when you tell the truth, even though the whole society around you is lying, when you, ref you are the one person who refuses to comply with an unjust law, you are giving permission to everybody else in the society to stand up with you. So if you want to do good in the world, and this is not just in the political segment, I'm, I'm putting this in the political segment, but it, it is all over the place. When you are the one person to speak the truth, even if it's unpopular, even if the controllers have manipulated the entire population uh, to despise that truth, if you're the one person to stand up for that truth, then you are giving, you are giving courage to other people to follow. Okay, now the next thing you can do is uh, prepare to defend yourself. Let's say prepare self-defense. And um, so by that I mean, uh, you know, buy guns, learn how to use them, uh, maybe have a house or an apartment that can be fortified easily, um, put, put fancy locks on your door, whatever you got to do. But I, I want to make it, I, I want to emphasize that I, I really don't want you to put your focus on this. Right, so if you can if you can go and make these preparations uh, fairly easily, then absolutely do. But on the other hand, if you if you're focusing on this, if you're constantly preparing for civil war, if you're constantly focusing on this 
like worst case situation outcome, then you are magnetizing yourself to that. This is a very negative um, headspace that you're putting yourself in if you're constantly focused on that. So I really, I really don't recommend making it a major focus. I recommend uh, doing your preparations if you can keep yourself mentally disconnected from it somewhat. It's like Jesus said that he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And another time he said that if somebody strikes you on the cheek, you should turn the other. Um, this is the reason for this, is that using your, your physical force to fight something is the least effective way of fighting it. And, and Jesus understood this very well, and that's why he always emphasized the spiritual, which, as we're going to get into later, is far, far more effective than trying to uh, fight on a, a physical level. That said, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, preparing yourself for a worst case situation. As long as you can keep yourself focused on the positive and focused on the things that are really gonna make a difference uh, rather than focusing on a, a very negative possible outcome. Now, the next thing I want to put in there is to actually figure out what's going on. Say, so learn what's really going on. Because if you, if you don't know what's really going on, and by the way, that was the, basically the whole purpose of my last video, was to arm you with that knowledge of what's really going on. And of course, I, I talked about more than just political, but uh, if you want to influence politics, if you want to vote, if you want to donate, etc., uh, then you better know what or who you're voting for, what or who you're donating to, because it's really easy to get lost in the mainstream me media narrative which is a lie, which is following the control agenda, and uh, say, okay, well, the, the, the candidate that the media says is good, that's who I'm going to vote for, that's who I'm going to donate to, right? And if you do that, if you don't really put in the study, put in the uh, research necessary to learn what's really going on, then you're going to be very misled, and you're actually going to be contributing towards the dark side of politics rather than helping. And I think you will find if you do this research, if you do this study, if you look for independent sources of information rather than corrupt, uh, bought and paid for sources of information, what you're going to find is that the, the media narrative and the, the, what's being paid for is often the polar opposite of what's true. Okay, so that's the political side. Again, that's the least effective. Now, uh, going down the pyramid to a little bit more effective is the economic side. So the first thing that you can do on the economic side is to use Bitcoin or cash. Now, uh, if you don't know what Bitcoin is, it's a cryptocurrency. It's a, a computerized currency that is decentralized. So it's not controlled by any one entity. It's uh, controlled collectively by millions of individual computers around the world. And there is no inflation in the system. There's nobody that can print money. Um, it's, it's a way to take power over the money supply away from anyone. There's no single person or entity that has power over Bitcoin. So the more you can support Bitcoin in the economy, um, the, the more you're taking away the economic power from the central banks. And you're giving the power, well, you're taking the power away from everybody, really, so that nobody has that power over their fellow human beings. And then I know that using Bitcoin is, is difficult, right? There's not a whole lot of merchants that'll take Bitcoin. And, you know, there's subject to crazy regulations and stuff. So I don't expect you to use that uh, all the time. But the, the next best thing you can do is use cash. Like I said, the... the um, control agenda is all about tracking everything we do and part of that is tracking our financial transactions and so if you're using a credit card or if you're using Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or you're using uh, wire transfers all of that stuff is tracked and monitored whereas if you use cash it by the way um, Bitcoin is that's all tracked and monitored too but the but the, the difference with Bitcoin is that it doesn't keep uh, it doesn't doesn't uh, associate your account with your name, right? So they can see that this account sent something to this account, but they have no idea who's, who belongs to each of those accounts. So Bitcoin doesn't really have that problem. And then with cash, of course, cash is completely untraceable for the most part. So paying with cash uh, takes away a little bit of the power of the people who want to control everything. Another thing you can do that is really helpful is to 
support independent businesses. Like I said, the part of the control agenda is to destroy independent sources of income. So um, the more that you can spend money on local stores, on local businesses, on uh, even internet businesses, that's just maybe a family or, or one person or a few people, um, the, the better you're going to be decentralizing that economic power. If you buy everything from Amazon and from Walmart and from these giant corporations, uh, well, it's the, the control agenda is all about consolidating the corporations, consolidating the companies, destroying the little guys, making the big ones bigger. And then if, if they have, I mean, if they have four companies that are huge companies, it's a lot easier to control than if they have a, a thousand small companies. So the more you support independent businesses, uh, the more you're supporting good, honest people and the less power you're giving to this centralized agenda. Next thing you can do is work for yourself. If you can start a business, if you can uh, start working as a freelancer, if you can get yourself to the point where you are not dependent on a company to give you a paycheck, then you have a lot more freedom, you have a lot more power to, uh, to, to work for this freedom agenda. The, the world we live in right now is one where most people are dependent on a job. They're dependent on one company to give them a paycheck and more and more companies, especially big companies, are showing that they're willing to fire people for having the wrong political beliefs, right? So if, if somebody finds out that you believe in a certain thing that they don't like, they'll call your employer and tell them to fire you because they don't like what you believe. And a lot of these big companies are doing it. And so you don't, you're stuck if you're in that situation. If you don't have your own independent source of income, then you're dependent on this company. And so you have to keep this company uh, happy. And whatever, whatever you're trying to do, if it's something that the company disagrees with or doesn't like, uh, or even if it's not politically correct and it's, it's not keeping the peace with people, you can very well lose your job. So if you can work for yourself, if you can come up with an independent source of income, and I've got a lot of stuff on my channel, by the way, about how to do this, like a lot of specific strategies. So check that out if that's something you're interested in. But if you have that independent income, then you're so much more free and you're in such a, a better situation that you're not economically dependent on any big company or even worse on the government. And then um, I also meant to put actually, or at least work remote. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about how to work remote, which to me is a, is a big step towards working for yourself. Because starting a business that can pay all your bills isn't something you just do overnight, right? It's, it's not something that's terribly easy to do. But if it, you can at least, if you still have a job, but you can at least put some distance between yourself and your employer, that, that gets you a little closer. It, it gets you a lot of your time back. It gives you a lot more of a feeling of freedom, which is going to contribute towards being more free in general. And a lot of that time back, uh, with a lot of that time that you get back, you can use to do the next thing, which is to learn skills, right? The more, the more things that you know how to do and the better that you know how to do them, the more economically self-sufficient you are going to be. So for example, if you're working at, let's say a customer service job and you know how to do customer service, but you don't really have any other job skills, well, that's a bad place to be because you're really dependent on that one type of job. And if the customer service all gets, gets outsourced to India or something, you're stuck, right? So it's, it's much better to learn the skills now. And the more skills you have, the more you can uh, be in independent business by using those skills. Right, so if you have customer service skills and you have computer programming skills and you have uh, auto mechanic skills and you have construction skills, right, you, you have so much more opportunity, right, both for a job and for starting your own business or working as a freelancer. So the more skills you have, the better. And the more latitude you're gonna have to fight an evil agenda because you're not beholden on one job or one particular career field, you have options. Okay, next thing you can do is don't support businesses that uh, buy in, that let's say 
support the evil agenda. Right? So if you go into a business and they say that uh, you have to wear this stupid thing over your face that is a symbol of compliance that's not actually helping anybody, then you can tell them, no thank you, I don't want to support that, I will take my business elsewhere. If businesses start to notice that people are not coming in, they're not spending their money with them because of the position that they've taken on some sort of political or social issue, then they will stop taking that position. They will stop trying to force you to do whatever it is that they think they should force you to do. Next thing you can do, which I, I highly recommend if it is all, at all possible for you, is to buy organic or local food. Or better yet, grow your own food. I mean, if you can, if you have some land that's available to you that you can grow your own food or raise your own animals or, you know, as much as you can do that yourself, then that's awesome. I mean, again, you know, you're picking your battles here. So if that's going to take up 80 hours a week, uh, so you can't do any of the other things and maybe don't do that. But the idea is to quit patronizing these giant mega farms that are putting all these horrible chemicals in your food and start buying what for one thing is healthier for your body and two is supporting good businesses that are that are making people healthier rather than making people sicker. And by supporting these businesses, you are helping to grow these businesses and shrink the businesses that are in the pocket of the evil agenda. Right, these giant agricultural companies that are controlled by the same people that are controlling everything. If you take the power away from them and into the hands of organic and local farmers, then you're doing your health a favor, but you're also, uh, you're also taking power away from the control agenda and putting it into the freedom agenda. Next thing that you can do is to stay out of debt. If, you are, if you're in debt, then you are beholden to somebody. In uh, ancient biblical times, they, or, uh, actually, I think this comes from Islam, actually. They, they see it that if you are in debt to somebody, that you are a slave to that person until you pay off the debt. So part of the control agenda has been to get everybody heavily into debt, right? Through the, this college scam through uh, this consumerism, they, easy credit. They say, um, get, you know, get this credit card and you can buy all the stuff you want. And uh, it, that way they get you into debt. And so if you want to quit your job, if you want to move, if you want to uh, try another lifestyle, well, it becomes very difficult to do that because you have to pay this interest on your debt all the time. So stay out of debt if you can. Now, again, this is going to uh, conflict in, in times with other things that, that is on the freedom agenda. So, for example, if you need to take out a loan to start a business, it might be worth it, right? So you just got to use your judgment to weigh uh, what is worth more than what. But if you're taking out a whole bunch of debt so you can buy new shoes or buy a new TV or, or something like that, then chances are uh, you're just enslaving yourself and you're making your own freedom more difficult. Now, uh, next thing I want to say is to get out of the city. So, um, if you, and by the way, I live in the city, and so some of these, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing all of these all the time, and some of these I'm in the process of doing. So I do plan to get out of the city eventually, uh, and, you know, I, I, of course, as I said, you got to pick your battles here. So I don't want to, like, come off as a hypocrite because I'm telling you to do something that I haven't done myself. But these are all things that will be effective. So if you can get out of the city, if you can have land, right, with land you can buy food. If you're, if you're in the city, piled on top of a whole bunch of other people in a giant apartment building, then you are, are really beholden to the food supply uh, in the grocery store. You're, you're really beholden to the large food companies. Whereas if you're out of the city, you're in the country, even if you don't have a farm yourself, but your next door neighbor is a farmer, right? You have much easier access to food that somebody evil doesn't have control over. So if you can get yourself out of the city, and of course the, the surveillance is a lot worse in the city, the pollution is a lot worse in the city, the uh, radiation in the in the environment is a lot worse in the city so there's a lot of good reasons to get out of the city the control agenda likes everybody to be in the city because when they're closer together they're easier to control they're easier to monitor so if you can get out of the city then i highly recommend it next thing that you can do is to keep yourself healthy 
if you get sick, if you have a condition, if you have cancer, if you have HIV, if, if you have diabetes, something like that, it's, it's almost like being in debt, right? Because you have to pay a whole bunch of money to this medical system to keep you alive. You don't have very much freedom if you're sick. So when I say keep yourself healthy, I don't mean to use the medical system. In fact, I would say be very skeptical of doctors and very skeptical of medical treatments, of drugs, of vaccines. Make, be, be very careful before you take anything like that because a lot of those, those so-called solutions just end up causing more problems and a lot of them cause addictions. So if, as I said, if they can get you addicted to a certain kind of pill, well, they've got you, right? You have to keep going back and back and back for that pill. You need to have the money for it, or you need to rely on the government, or you need to rely on a health maintenance organization, or you need to uh, rely on an employer. You have so much less freedom if you're not healthy. So I would say keep yourself healthy in a, in a natural way. Make your environment as natural as you possibly can. Get away from pollution. Get away from energy pollution, from, from radiation. You know, this, this situation where we have cell phone towers and, and uh, internet modems and all this radiation coming from a gazillion different angles, it's not good for us, right? So the more, and, and you know, I'm not telling you to, to like, move out into a shack in the middle of the woods with with no connection to anything you know just be smart about this try to reduce the amount of radiation that you're that you're exposed to as much as you possibly can eat healthy whole food that is organically grown that's not grown with a bunch of pesticides right get out and get sunlight talk to people you know uh, worship god do the things that will make you mentally healthy because your mental health becomes your physical health Go out in the sun, get your proper sleep, right? And you might have noticed that with this whole pandemic situation, a lot of that stuff is being discouraged or completely banned, right? They're saying, stay, stay away from other people. Don't go outside. Don't exercise. Don't get sunlight. Don't go to church and worship God. All of the things that you need to do in order to keep yourself healthy, they're telling you to stop doing. So do your best to defy that agenda, keep yourself healthy, because if you're sick, then you're basically out of the fight. Okay, now let's get into the things you can do on a cultural level. Now the first one I want to say is to stay close to friends and family. Like I said, they're trying to separate us, right? They're trying to, to, to get us to be suspicious of other people, to stay away from other people, to not gather with other people. And the reason for that is because people communicate more effectively when they're face to face, right? I mean, you can think about this if you have a political discussion with somebody on Facebook, nine times out of 10, it ends ugly, right? Whereas if you have a conversation with somebody face to face, you have that, that innate instinct to have respect for that person because you actually see that human being in front of you rather than seeing just a tiny little square on a screen that represents the person. So uh, ideas that are let's say, contrary to the control agenda, are going to spread better when you're, you're talking to people face to face, when you're having that human interaction. So if you're interacting with other people, with, with good, well-intentioned people, then you're getting positive inputs. Whereas if you're stuck at home all by yourself and you're afraid to go outside, well, probably you're watching the news and you're looking at Facebook and you're getting all this negativity, whereas you're going to get a much more uh, positive, you're going to get positivity and you're going to spread positivity to the people around you if you are actually seeing your friends and your family in person. Next thing that you can do is, I'll say, turn off the TV. And I, I mean that symbolically, I mean, get rid of mainstream media get rid of mainstream news, get rid of mainstream entertainment. Don't let that garbage into your mind in the first place. It feeds negativity, it destroys your hopes, it destroys your dreams. It's the propaganda that the control agenda uses to keep you under control. So if you can stop, uh, stop exposing yourself to that, then the more power you are going to have, the more you're going to free your mind and the less time you spend listening to lies and manipulation, the more time you have to either listen to something good and wholesome or to actually do something. 
And I just realized I, turn, I said turn of the TV, so I will go ahead and correct that. And so the next thing, of course, is to uh, read, study, good content. Despite all the suppression, there is a lot, a lot of good stuff out there, right? And I, I tried to share some of that on my YouTube channel. Um, there's a lot of really good books out there. The, the people who wish to control things have not, uh, have not put much effort into controlling books. I've noticed this, that there are a lot of really good books with really good truthful information that is very much opposed to their control agenda, and they are available, right? That they, they want to do the book burning thing, but it's difficult because we have such a cultural taboo about book burning. Now, Amazon is starting to do this, right? Amazon is starting to remove authors and books that uh, go against the control agenda. However, there are millions of these books in print and there are electronic versions of millions of really, really good books out there. So I highly recommend reading. I, I recommend finding good stuff on the internet. On YouTube is a, well, it, it is a good resource for now. It's, it's, they're censoring content more and more, so it's gonna get to be less and less of a good resource. So I recommend that um, you, you also check out alternatives, right? Like there's one that I use called LBRY. I'll go ahead and write that for you so you got it. The name of the service is called LBRY. It's a video sharing service like YouTube, but it's based on a blockchain that works the way that Bitcoin works. It's completely decentralized, so it's impossible to censor. So the more the more content gets censored by YouTube, uh, the more the, the good content is going to migrate to better platforms like LBRY. And in fact, I meant to put that as the next point, is to uh, use free speech platforms. So, like LBRY is, a, is an alternative to, um, to YouTube. And there's one called Gab that's a social media. And I'm not a, really a big fan of social media, but if you have to use social media, uh, I'd much rather you use these than the, than the, the corporate controlled ones that delete everything that goes against their terms of service, which is just everything that's something that their, their political agenda disagrees with. Something I, I highly recommend is a, uh, a web browser called DuckDuckGo, or it's a search engine and a web browser. Because I've noticed that Google is censoring search results a lot now. I, it didn't used to until recently, but I've started noticing this, that if I want to search for a certain topic that's somewhat politically incorrect, nothing comes up on Google. The only thing that comes up are these uh, mainstream media sources, and if I want the truth, they're not going to show it. However, DuckDuckGo is an alternative search engine that will show you these things. So I highly recommend switch, uh, switch out DuckDuckGo for Google, especially if it's something, if you're looking for something that's a little bit controversial. Next thing you can do is uh, get off social media. And I, I'm not saying you have to like delete your accounts, right? I, I still have accounts on most of my social media. I just don't use them very much, right? If you're, if you're focusing a lot of time, if you're dedicating a lot of time to social media, that's, be honest with yourself. Is that time spent to good use? Probably not, right? And you're probably getting a lot of negative influences because all of the people that you've collected over the years in your social media, um, probably for most of us, those people are, are not very conscious, let's say, and they feed a lot of negativity to us. And in fact, the way that the algorithms work are that the most negative posts are the ones that get most promoted. So if you're on social media, you're one, you're wasting your time that you could be doing something better off. You can do, you could be doing something better with. I used to know how to talk. And then the second thing is that you're, you're just getting yourself uh, a whole bunch of negativity, which is going to reduce your ability to, to make anything good happen, right? If you're in this negative disempowered mood where you think that nothing ever, nothing ever changes and nothing I do makes any difference, like that, uh, like that Linkin Park song, which is absolutely horrible. It says, I, I tried so hard, but in the end, it didn't really matter, right? There's, there's a reason that this kind of, of music is pushed on us, even though it's, it's not a good song in any way, right? It's, it's not a, like a musically good song or a lyrically good song. It's pushing disempowerment. 
That's what they're trying to do to you. So, I, I, you know, I'm getting off on a tangent. I'm talking about the turn off the TV. The same thing goes with mainstream music, right? The mainstream music is controlled as well. But social media, you get a lot of negativity from. Negativity disempowers you, and the feeling of disempowerment, of discouragement, will make you less effective. Next thing you can do is to say things that are politically incorrect, right? Like I told you about that story about the, or well, the emperor's new clothes, that it was the little boy who was willing to say the thing that nobody else was willing to say that shattered the illusion for everybody else. If you're the one who's willing to say the thing that is clearly true, but uh, banned for some reason or, or looked down upon, then you give permission for everybody else to say the same thing. Now, I do think you should use some tact here, right? I mean, I'm not saying to go and, and say uh, horrible things that people are, are is going to offend people just for the sake of offending people. I'm saying, tell the truth. Do it in a tactful way. You know, don't try to hurt anybody's feelings, but be willing to speak the truth and... Uh, a lot of other people are going to see that and they're going to be willing to speak the truth. They're going to get courage because you had that courage first. Another thing you can do, which is really big, is to support and encourage the family, right? The family is, is massively under attack in culture, right? They have all, all this stuff about how having kids is terrible and it's uh, doing bad things for the planet, and um, men are evil, and women should avoid men, and men should avoid women, and the, the family is an antiquated religious concept that only superstitious people follow, etc., etc., etc. We're getting all of this propaganda shoved down our throats. So, in your personal conversations with people, push back against that. Congratulate people for getting married, for having kids, you know, glorify the people that have a big family. You know, glorify the, the mother that's willing to spend her time homeschooling her children, who, the, the parents who are willing to put in their time and energy to growing a, a healthy and happy family. And then, of course, uh, the last thing I want to talk about in, in culture is to have kids, right? If you are bringing kids into the world and raising them right, then you are contributing to a better world. Now, again, I don't have any kids myself, so I don't want to come off as a hypocrite, but somebody who is rightly aligned, who is having kids, is doing a service to the world, and, well, a service to the world that I'm not doing as of, the, as of this point. Okay, now let's finally get to the strategies that we can apply on a spiritual level. This, again, this is the base of the pyramid. This is the most effective uh, tool we have. Right, I mean, if you might have noticed when we went over the control agenda in the last video that it's pretty daunting, right? The, the enemy, the forces of evil have uh, a, lot of, a lot of power in the political, the economic, and the cultural arenas. However, the spiritual is going to be our saving grace because we have far more power than they do, or at least we have the potential to have far more power than, we, than they do. Because righteous spirituality is a lot more powerful than dark spirituality. And in fact, the only dark spirituality that's allowed to operate is that which God, the, the source of righteousness, allows because it's for some greater good. For some, it, it plays some part in the, in the plan of, of bringing us up in our, our moral and our spiritual evolution. So basically, the, the situation is, it's like, um, it's like if you're in a fight to the death with somebody and the other guy has a bow and arrow and you have a fighter jet, right? If I asked you, if, if somebody with a bow and arrow fought somebody with a fighter jet, who would win? Well, the answer is it depends on how well they know how to use their weapons, right? Because if the guy with the fighter jet has absolutely no idea how to fly a fighter jet then it's not much good to him, and he's probably going to get killed pretty quick by the guy with the bow and arrow. So that's why the, the satanic forces in this world recognize this. They recognize that our spiritual power is much, much greater than, that, than theirs is, so they try to keep us from accessing it. They try to keep us in the dark about it. They try to uh, force us to believe that it doesn't exist. And that's why such a big part of this control agenda 
is about suppressing spirituality because they know that if we woke up to our, our true power, then they wouldn't stand a chance. Now, dark spirituality does give them power, right? I mean, just like a bow and arrow is a deadly weapon, it's just a, a much less effective one than the one that we have at our disposal. And the propaganda is coming from all angles, by the way. I mean, it's coming through the media that tells you that you're a superstitious idiot if, if you believe in religion. It comes from the school system that, that basically preaches atheism and pushes that on us. But it also comes from our religious organizations. That uh, even though spirituality is a big part of pretty much every religion that I know of, a lot of religious organizations are very opposed to any practice of spirituality. If you talk with the typical American Christian, for example, uh, they, they don't want anything to do with spirituality. If, if you have a spiritual experience, they automatically assume it's, it's of the devil, right? So our, our religious institutions have been subverted. And of course, some more than others, but we have to break out of this brainwashing that's coming from uh, all different angles of society. So the first thing that uh, I would recommend in order to do this is that you break free of labels and organizations. Now, the, I mean, the, the most obvious form of this is if you have a religious organization that is political, that there is one guy at the top that makes a proclamation and then everybody under him has to accept it as truth. And uh, obviously I, I'm calling out the Catholic Church in particular here, but even Protestant churches work this way sometimes, right? If you're, if you're a, a Lutheran and you are beheld, you are held to uh, whatever the, the top of the Lutheran Church says that you're supposed to believe, or even with what Martin Luther himself says that you're supposed to believe, you're putting yourself in a box that I don't think is healthy. And the same thing is true even with just with labels, right? Even if you, uh, if you label yourself a, a Christian or a Muslim or a Protestant or an Evangelic or a Catholic or, or spiritual but not religious or, you know, Wiccan or whatever, whatever label you put on yourself, um, is a little bit oppressive, and this is true outside of religion too. It's true with politics and various other things, because uh, you, whenever you come across something that seems to disagree with your label, then a lot of people are, are more attached to the label than they are to the fact that they have encountered. So if you, uh, my recommendation is that you focus less on, on the labels of your religion or lack of religion, as the case may be, and, and focus on the truth. Make your loyalty entirely to the truth. This, this is true about leaders, too, right? If you have a particular religious leader or spiritual leader or talking head or a person on YouTube, even me, I mean, I, I don't, don't, don't listen to me like I'm saying something that's, that's gospel, right? Everything I say uh, should be up to your judgment to figure out whether or not you're going to accept it. And probably I see, say some things that are wrong sometimes. And if I do, I would, I would very much appreciate if you correct me on those because I don't know everything. And the same is true with any other person who is, is spreading ideas, right? That people are all fallible. And if you're thinking rightly, in my view, um, your loyalty is to the truth. It's not to any organization. It's not to any, any label. And it's definitely not to any particular person. Next thing I recommend is to meditate. Uh, I recommend that you make a practice of doing this daily, and if you can do it more than daily, then even better. Now, I won't go in too into detail about this, but the more you slow down, um, the, more you, the more you're quiet, the more you quiet the chattering thoughts in your mind, the more receptive you are to impressions from the spiritual world. We live in a world in our current society where uh, our attention is a currency, where everybody is trying to, trying to compete for our attention and we are always available, right? We have a, a the, the smartphone was the worst thing ever for our uh, presence, let's say, because 
we have push notifications and we have calls and we have text messages and we have a little a bunch of little beeps and dings that that give us uh, notifications of a million different things and we always have the phone right beside us right so um, we get into this this space where we're totally reactive and we we have everything is kind of yelling in our ear metaphorically speaking whereas in order to in order to hear God uh, the Bible says that, that God speaks in a still small voice well if you're going to hear a still small voice you have to get rid of all the noise around you or you're never gonna hear it and actually I think this is a big part of the reason that modern society is so not spiritual right is because in in more primitive societies uh, they it was quieter they didn't have somebody screaming in their ear 24 7 right they didn't have 10,000 advertisers all all trying to chase them down and 10,000 different phone apps all trying to um, trying to modify their algorithms to make them maximally addictive right they didn't have all of this artificial stimulation so they were much more open to to hear the the spiritual so I recommend that you you set aside a time <clears throat> to meditate every day. Um, I do this first thing in the morning because I, I like first thing in the morning because I haven't developed a whole big thought pattern of mental chatter yet in the day. But if you can uh, set aside a few minutes, you know, however however long it might be, to just be quiet and listen basically quiet your mind quiet your environment and just listen and then whenever you get the chance to do it throughout the day I recommend that as well and you'll find that you have a lot of chances to do that right if you're if you're sitting in a car in traffic and it, the, the reason that we're so impatient too is because we have all this stimulation right if we're sitting in a car in traffic uh, well it's it's this time that we don't really have to do anything but if you can get to where meditating is kind of a lifestyle for you, then you can have a really pleasant experience in a car sitting in traffic because you're just alone listening to the universe. And this is the way that you come up with good ideas. This is the way that you get intuitions. This is the way that spirits speak to you. So if you want a really good, ide a good way to have good ideas a lot, then start meditating. Learn to quiet down and listen. I mean, I, I heard uh, somebody said recently, I thought this was cool, they said that, that prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening. So if you want the best possible source of guidance that you could ever possibly get, get start a meditation practice, you'll get it. And by the way, the, the forces of evil know how to do this as well right they they are getting direction they are getting intuition from entities from the spirit world that have a higher perspective right because they the spirits even even evil spirits can see more than humans can so they get a little extra direction it's like a a, a little unfair advantage that people who who access this have i like to think of it as um is a, a video game it's kind of a nerdy analogy but you know when you're playing one of those first person shooter games and your your view is just the the hands on the gun and then some of those some similar games are a third person where you're a few feet behind the person so you see the whole person that you're controlling and so if you go around a corner you can kind of manipulate the the view so that you can see around the corner without exposing your guy to the the people around the corner so I think that's a good analogy for uh, when you have that that uh, spiritual guidance you have the person who's standing behind you who can see around the corner before you can so anyway you'll get in much better touch with that if you develop a regular meditation practice now the next thing which is really helpful to go along with it is to study I'll say study or read and I mean study or read spiritual topics here move this over before it gets all messed up so study or read on, on from people who have studied spirituality and you'd be amazed actually how much literature there is on this it's absolutely mind-blowing 
There was a, uh, a French scientist named Allan Kardec in the 1800s who literally made it his life's mission to study spiritual phenomena from a scientific perspective. And the results he came up with are absolutely mind-blowing. And I think it's uh, practically a crime that this stuff isn't taught, that this is forgotten uh, by most of history, at least in the U.S. It's actually pretty popular in Brazil, which is how I found out about it. But uh, if you can read, I'll, I'll go ahead and write those down there. Read uh, Alan Kardec. Especially, I recommend you start with a book called The Spirit's Book, which is this, it, it's a long book, but it, it goes into just the nuts and bolts of how the spirit world operates and how the spirit world interacts with the physical world. Absolutely fascinating, mind-blowing stuff. And you'll, I, I, for me at least, I, I just recognize so much truth in it. I, I just read so many things and I was like, oh, that explains that. That explains what was happening there, right? It, it, it makes reality so much clearer. And then another author that I, I recommend that uh, writes on the same topic is Chico Xavier, who is a, a Brazilian writer and um, wrote, his books are kind of, uh, Kind of like novels, like first-person novels from people who lived on the earth and died and now are, are living in the spirit world. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff from kind of a first-person perspective. So if you want to learn how spirituality works, if you want to be able to access an incredible source of power that you have at your fingertips, if you want to learn how to fly that fighter jet that is in your garage, then this is how you do it. And there's a lot more material than this. Of course, there's a bunch of good stuff on YouTube. Um, there's a lot of it's in the Bible, actually, but the, the, the Bible has been so, so poorly interpreted over the years, especially when it comes to spiritual things, that a, a lot of us that, that grew up learning the Bible have been very much misled as to its true meaning. But anyway, I don't want to go into the gazillion different authors and books that you can read on this, because there's a lot. But uh, I'm going to be covering this extensively on my channel. Which, of course, you should go ahead and subscribe to if you haven't already. And hit that little bell icon beside the subscribe button so you're the first to get all my new videos. And while you're at it, go ahead and hit that thumbs up because it makes the YouTube algorithm like me more. Anyway, next thing that you can do that is very helpful is go to church. Or even better, Spiritus Center if you can find it. There's, uh, I think it's spiritism.us where you can find a local group of, these are people who, who uh, make it a lifestyle to study this stuff, right? So they, um, they understand it, and in my experience, they understand it a lot better than the, than the typical church does. But, you know, if you don't have access to that, then going to church is a whole lot better than nothing. Even though, like I said, I think a, a lot of churches have been robbed of their spiritual aspect, but... Even so, the basis of religion is spirituality. So even a, a kind of, how would you say, a adulterated or a, a diluted spirituality that you find in church is better than no spirituality at all. And it gives you that chance to interact with other people. And so, which actually brings me to my next uh, point here, which is to share with others. When, when you're learning this stuff, Tell other people, right? Because literally every person in the world will benefit from this. Everybody. And there's, you know, how you tell other people depends on their, their frame of mind. It depends on uh, their level of open-mindedness. It depends on where they're coming from, right? So, for example, uh, when, when I do this, I, I kind of see people in two groups. There are the, the religious people and then there are the materialists. So for the religious people, I try to connect on religion, right? Which is, especially for Christians, is really easy to do because everything in, um, about spirituality is consistent with Christianity. In fact, Christ himself taught a lot of this stuff, but uh, it, it's mostly just glossed over. And then on the other hand are the materialists, the, the atheistic types, the people who believe that there's no such thing as anything supernatural, that kind of thing. And 
With them, I, I like to come from a basis of science. For example, did you know that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of studies that prove that faith healing actually works, that faith healing heals people, which is something I, uh, I described in, in this video from a book I read called Mind to Matter by Dawson Church, which I highly recommend, by the way. But the point is that the truth exists concurrently with religion and science. The truth is what unites the two. The truth is in the overlap between the two. So you can pick and choose what people are more comfortable with and emphasize that part because you can come at it from both sides and it works just as well either way. The next thing you can do, and this is open to everybody, regardless of your, your knowledge of esoteric things, regardless of your knowledge of the spirit world, is to just be a better person. And this is why religion, properly applied, is accessible to anybody, right? You don't, you don't have to be very smart. You don't have to be a genius to understand love your neighbor as yourself, right? The, the moral precepts, which are the, uh, the, the guiding force of religion, of spirituality, which are, these are natural laws, that morality is a guiding force of the universe. So somebody who is completely incapable of understanding all this deep esoteric stuff, if that person can understand love your neighbor as yourself, then that's plenty good enough. And so if you are a better person, you're going to be a force for good in the world, and that's going to have uh, vibratory effects uh, long, long outside of your immediate circle, right? I mean, you know that if you're good to one person, then that person has absorbed a, a better energy and is going to pass that on to somebody else, and you have this giant ripple effect that makes all of society better. And of course, it's going to give you more power. It's literally going to give you more energy. It's going to give you uh, more happiness. It's going to make you more encouraged. You are going to be more effective in everything that you do if you can make yourself a better person. And then, um, more specifically, be good to others. If you are good to others, it stops evil in its tracks. And it stops the evil agenda in its tracks. If you think about, I, I talked about in the last video, I talked about these race conflicts and well, race conflicts and class conflicts and sex conflicts and all this stuff and be good to others. That is the solution to literally all of those. Because if you think about the race conflicts, for example, probably um, some white person did something evil to some black person and then that black person thought, oh, white people are evil, so I'm going to be nasty to white people. And so he went and did something nasty to a white person. And that white person said, oh, black people are nasty. I'm going to be nasty to black people. And you see how it's this ping pong effect that just goes on forever and ever and ever. Well, if you can be the first one to stand up and say, okay, even if somebody was nasty to me, I'm going to be good to everybody. You're the one who is stopping it. Right? If you can be good to others, then there's no need for prejudice. Like It, it just does not uh, come up with people who are good to each other. So the, the racial conflicts stop. The um, gender conflicts stop. The class conflicts stop. The basic interpersonal conflicts stop if everybody can be good to each other. And the, you don't have to wait for everybody else to start. You can be the one to start, and it will have an effect. And being good to people is contagious, by the way. If you're good to somebody, that might just motivate them to be good to somebody else. And this is true with everybody in society. You know, I was talking in, in the last video about all the, these people that have power, these people that have power in government and the United Nations and the World Health Organization and the corporations, etc. People who are... Uh, following an evil agenda are still human beings. Just because they're oriented towards evil doesn't mean that they have to be oriented towards evil forever. A really good example of this is a, a man named Yuri Bezimov, who was a KGB agent in the, the Soviet government who was charged with spreading communism to India. 
which is a fascinating, absolutely fascinating interview that you can find on YouTube, unless they've censored it already. But he was this um, communist agent in India, and his job was to was to destabilize the Indian society and weaken their culture until a point where they were susceptible to, to be taken over by communism. And as he was doing this work, living in India, he decided that he liked the Indian people and he didn't want to keep doing evil to them. And so he left. He quit and then he told the world exactly what was going on. He told the world what was happening. So even people that are actively working evil, if there are people that are good to them, as this, these Indian people must have been to Yuri Bezimov, then you're taking the wind out of his sails, right? He's not going to want to keep doing evil against you. So the more and more we treat people well, the more the people that are that are part of this evil agenda and the more they're pawns right because most people that are part of this agenda have absolutely no idea that they're part of this agenda i mean if you think about all of the the policemen and the soldiers um that are enforcing this stuff and the the people that that work for companies that just work for a day job they don't know that they're involved in this agenda they have absolutely no idea they have no bad intentions and even the high levels, like the, the politicians and the people that are running the UN and the, the shadowy cabal at the top, you know, if you believe in that stuff, all of those people are susceptible to turning from evil to turning good. And the, the way that you start that is just to be good to them. What I believe more and more to be true is that, that spreading love is a much, much more effective strategy than fighting hate. As I was talking about up here, about uh, preparing for your self-defense, um, I, I, I think there's a place for that, but this be good to others is just so much more effective, right? This, and this is why Jesus said to turn the other cheek. This is why Jesus said to uh, bless those who curse you, right? Because you can, you can stop their evil ways. If you go out and shoot somebody in the government because that person is doing evil, well, that person's going to be replaced the next day. The evil agenda is still going to be there, and uh, that person is just going to be replaced by somebody else, and the person that you shot, well, their spirit isn't going to disappear. Their spirit is just going to keep fighting the same battle, but from the other side. So if you can be good to others, is a matter of being that will make an enormous impact in the world. In fact, even just one one small act of kindness can go a long way. Now, the next uh, last one I want to go over, actually, and this is maybe, uh, well, among the most important, is to have faith and pray. The way the world works is is largely a matter of our focus and of our faith. Jesus said that with just a mustard seed of faith that you could uh, tell a mountain to jump into the sea and it would follow your orders. There is a universal law that what you believe will happen tends to happen. There is an enormous power in believing that something is going to happen, which is why faith healing works, right? This is something that's medically documented over and over and over again. If you believe that you are going to be healed because you took a sugar pill, you are quite a bit more likely to be healed than if you didn't believe it. This is something that's very well documented and it has applications far beyond just human health. And so that's why I was, I was kind of hesitant talking about preparing self-defense because if you have this idea that there's gonna be a civil war, or the, the government's gonna try to come rip you out of your house, the more you believe that, the more you focus on that, the more you give it energy, the more likely it is to come true, right? The more you're, you're putting energy into that particular outcome. So I, I try to warn against um, thinking that way. Think that we are going to be victorious, which is true, by the way. There's no possible way that we're not going to be victorious. But like I said, we have a choice of, of what we're going to do to contribute to that. And depending on what we do or don't do, it might be longer lasting. It might be more suffering in the meantime. But if we have faith that everything is under control, that everything is going to turn out well, and especially that we have faith that our efforts are helping, 
then we're going to get to our objective a lot faster and a lot with a lot less suffering. And prayer is almost the same thing. You are asking God for this outcome, and while you are asking, I mean, Jesus said that ask and it will be given. If while you are asking, you have faith that it will be accomplished, then that's far more powerful than asking for something that you have absolutely no faith at all that you're going to get. So keep your mind focused on that positive outcome. Expect that positive outcome. Pray for that positive outcome. In fact, I think in its true its sense, that's what prayer actually is, is meant to be. It's not asking God for something like, like a child would ask his parents for something. Because the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Your prayer is not going to change God's mind. However, your prayer does influence the universal laws that create all of the outcomes that we see both in the spiritual world and in the physical world. Now, another reason to have faith, another very positive thing that is happening right now is that we're going through a, a planetary transition. And what that is, this is actually foretold in quite a few religions about uh, this particular era, is that the world is going through a transition from a lower state into a higher state, that the world is getting better, right? And there's going to be some growing pains in that. I mean, this is what the, the Bible uh, prophesied in Revelation with uh, all the plagues and the mark of the beast and that. It's the turmoil where all of the old forces, the satanic agenda that controls the world right now, is gradually losing its power and it's going to lash out um, it's going to act in desperation as it is replaced. Now, the way this replacement is going to happen is from new spirits coming to the earth. So I told you in the last video that I'd explain why this agenda of evil is so intent on, on preventing more people from being born. This agenda is so intent on this this uh, overpopulation myth and depopulating the world and pushing abortions on everybody and pushing birth control and, and destroying families and pitting men against women and saying that, that motherhood is something to be ashamed of and pushing this thing in the media that says that you shouldn't have any more children, right? They're so intent on stopping new children from being born because they are aware that this is happening. They know that the new generation is going to be of a higher moral evolution than us that are on the earth right now, and they will do anything they can to slow that, to stop the, this new generation from being born in the first place. And again, if you want to understand this more fully, then go back to this, study and read. Read Alan Kardec, read Chico Xavier, read all those other authors that, that uh, read the ancient materials that have been uh, have been foretelling of this for literally thousands of years. So that's it. I really appreciate you sticking with me for all this. I realized that this was a long video. The last one was even longer. And so uh, I'm glad that you stayed till the end. And it's an honor to be able to fight by your side for this new freedom agenda and for this amazing planetary transition that we have to look forward to. Now, as a little thank you, if you haven't already, um, I'll put a link down below. You can get my little mini ebook called The Eight Daily Habits for Happiness, Success, and Spiritual Fulfillment, which I think will be very helpful for you. And of course, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, hit the thumbs up button. And if you want more to watch, then check out this video I did all about tackling the big question, which is what is the meaning of life? So, you know, I, again, don't take my word as gospel, but if you want my take on that, then check that out. And of course, if you think that somebody else needs to see this video, please share it as well.